Imagine this. You are about to go through one of the most painful deaths that a person can experience. There will be humiliation and insults thrown at you. And the people coming to arrest you are coming soon. How will you feel? The book of Luke tells the story of Jesus' final journey to his death. From his prayer in Gethsemane, where his faith in God is confirmed, to his burial in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, the Bible describes how an innocent man came to die for others. The Jewish leadership, however, could not obtain evidence to convict Jesus. As a result, Jesus speaks the words that lead to his death. Ironically, he dies for telling the truth. In Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 46, Jesus turns from addressing his disciples to praying to the Father. And he came out and went, as was his habit, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived at the place called Gethsemane, he said to them, Pray continually, that you may not fall into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup of divine wrath from me. Yet not my will, but always yours be done. The Garden of Gethsemane was located on the Mount of Olives' western slope. Jesus frequently went there to pray, and the disciples, including the betrayer, were well aware of this. After the Lord's Supper, Jesus and the disciples exited the upper room and went to the garden. When they arrived, he warned them to pray so that they would not succumb to temptation. Perhaps the temptation he had in mind was the pressure to abandon God and his Christ as the enemies closed in. His openness in prayer demonstrates the depth and quality of his relationship with the Father. This is an important moment because he turns to God just before his arrest. In the prayer, we see both Jesus' anguish and his desire to do God's will, even if it means losing his life. The disciples underestimate the gravity of the situation and they fall asleep. What they require is not rest, but a renewed turn to God, lest they fail. Luke chapter 22, verse 37. For I tell you that this scripture which is written must be completed and fulfilled in me. And he was counted with the criminals, for that which refers to me has its fulfillment and is settled. Jesus takes his customary evening trip to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples accompany him. Before he prays, he instructs them to pray in order to avoid temptation. One almost gets the impression that he is exemplifying what he expects of them. As the time for his sacrifice approaches, all of his emotional anguish will be laid before the Father on a prayer altar. If the discourse here indicates the temptation the disciples will have, is the possibility of denying him. Prayer is crucial, since it brings us into fellowship with God and allows us to draw on his presence with us. In this context, Jesus' command to pray, written in a Greek present imperative, may suggest an ongoing commitment to pray as opposed to a single moment of prayer. Temptation is detoured only by persistent reliance on God. Luke chapter 11 verse 4 And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, who has offended or wronged us. And lead us not into temptation, but rescue us from evil. Jesus prays about a stone's throw from the disciples, a distance of several yards. Genesis chapter 21 verse 16 Then she went and sat down opposite him, about a bow shot away. For she said, Do not let me see the boy die. And as she sat down opposite him, she raised her voice and wept. The text says he pulled away from his disciples, 
which adds a touch of emotion to the story. He kneels and intercedes, asking if there is another way to accomplish what is ahead. The request is couched in Jesus' fundamental commitment to doing God's will. Father, if you are willing. At this point, the thought in Greek is shortened, indicating intense emotion. Take this cup from me, Jesus pleads. Such a request for a change in God's will is not unprecedented. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 25 to 26. Then the king told Zadok, Take the ark of God back to its rightful place in the city of Jerusalem, the capital. If I find favor in the Lord's sight, he will bring me back again and let me see both it and his dwelling place, habitation. But if he should say, I have no delight in you, then here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. Jesus desires that the cup of wrath be removed from him, but only if there is another way. Yet not my will, but yours be done, he adds. Jesus has bracketed his request on each end with a commitment to do God's will. Luke chapter 22, verses 43 to 45. Now an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, deeply distressed and anguished, almost to the point of death, he prayed more intently, and a sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not fall into temptation. An angel appears to comfort him. The significance of the angelic appearance is that it demonstrates heaven's willingness to stand by Jesus as he faces his calling. As Jesus prays more fervently and sweats drops of blood, the intensity of the emotion grows. The text uses the Greek term agonia to describe Jesus' intense anguish. As he faces rejection and death, Jesus lays his burdens before God. This is a very human portrait of Jesus as he faces his death with a range of emotions. Luke's portrait of Jesus does not conceal his divinity. He portrays Jesus as someone who can relate to our flaws and traumas. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize and understand our weaknesses and temptations, but one who has been tempted, knowing exactly how it feels to be human, in every respect as we are, yet without committing any sin. Finally, Jesus gets up and returns to his disciples, finding them exhausted from sorrow and asleep. Number six. They have begun to understand that rejection for Jesus lies just ahead, which has wiped them out emotionally. Jesus inquires why they are sleeping at this critical juncture, and again urges them to pray that they will not succumb to temptation. They will only be ready for what is ahead if they prepare for it as he has. Faithfulness is grounded in being in touch with God. This text reveals something about Jesus' character while demonstrating how we can face the great trials of life that God sends us. These verses show a man who is reliant on God and determined to do his will. We see a person who faces adversity by turning to God and another who expresses his intense emotions to God in prayer. On the other hand, the disciples have only their exhaustion and emotional pain. Despite Jesus' exhortation to pray, Number all they seven. can do is sleep. Everything about Jesus' approach exemplifies how to deal with the stress of adversity. Jesus is not spared the trial, but what is supplied is the strength to face it. Though he does not hesitate to ask if another way can be found, he affirms his determination to follow God's will. Heaven responds 
by giving Jesus the strength to face what God has called him to do, not by granting his request for another way. The passage revolves around the union of submission to the divine call and divine strength supplied. This passage reveals exemplary points about Jesus' character as he faces the cross trial. In prayer, Jesus expresses both his pain and his need to God. His custom of communing with God is unaffected by the unusual events that occur in his life. We frequently neglect to go to God with our needs when we are the busiest. Trials frequently bring us to our knees, but the hectic pace of life frequently keeps us on the move and prevents us from praying. That is not true of Jesus. His pattern reminds us that prayer is essential, even in the midst of chaos. And his prayer is not just a check-in, it is full of honesty, emotion, and pain. True prayer necessitates effort. Too often, rather than laboring in prayer, we bow our heads, close our eyes, and let our minds wander. In prayer, Jesus demonstrates honesty and humility. He sincerely hopes that God will not force him to go through what is ahead of him and shares this openly, but he is even more committed to doing God's will. The prayer, while distinct from the laments and psalms, is similar in that the petitioners also expressed their deepest emotions and pain to God. The private confrontation that occurs in prayer frequently produces the solace we require to take our next steps while holding God's hand. Furthermore, prayer is not a haphazard activity. As he seeks God in the midst of his situation, Jesus prays with his entire being. He even sweats blood drops. Jesus can walk with God because he seeks God on a regular basis. The disciples, on the other hand, are a stunning example because they sleep rather than pray as Jesus instructed. We frequently approach our problems in the manner, I will think about it tomorrow. This type of procrastination contends that time or fate will resolve such issues. We as his disciples must see prayer time at our meetings and functions as part of the work of ministry itself where a genuine transaction of relationship takes place between God and us. It is interesting that Luke, a physician, would bring up this unusual medical condition. Hematidrosis is a rare condition. The current understanding is that when someone is stressed, tiny capillaries within sweat glands rupture, allowing blood to mix with sweat. As explained by Dr. Frederick Zugaby, around the sweat glands, there are multiple blood vessels in a net-like form. Under the pressure of great stress, the vessels constrict. Then, as the anxiety passes, the blood vessels dilate to the point of rupture. The blood goes into the sweat glands. As the sweat glands are producing a lot of sweat, it pushes the blood to the surface coming out as droplets of blood mixed with sweat. This certainly describes Jesus' situation in the garden, but there is one tricky word in the Greek which should give us a bit of pause. The text says that his sweat became Jose, great drops of blood. Jesus in Gethsemane and his agony is the main point of the narrative. The context of these verses has such a dramatic shift it is actually more pronounced in Mark's Gospel. He is eating Passover with the disciples. They are singing a hymn. There is resolve, but no distress. When Jesus arrives in the garden, he tells his disciples that he is deeply troubled and distressed. He is overcome with grief to the point of death. Luke captures this by referring to sweat as if it were drops of blood. Why is he overcome right now? Jonathan Edwards captures it well. Christ was going to be cast into a dreadful furnace of wrath, and it was not proper that he should plunge himself into it blindfold, as not knowing how dreadful the furnace was. 
Therefore, that he might not do so, God first brought him and set him at the mouth of the furnace, that he might look in and stand in view its fierce and raging flames, and might see where he was going, and might voluntarily enter into it and bear it for sinners, as knowing what it was. This view Christ had in his agony. Then God brought the cup that he was to drink and set it down before him, that he might have a full view of it and see what it was before he took it and drank it. He is viewing the sin of all humanity. Again, words are going to escape us. His pain was not simple, but rather complex. We could only begin to comprehend his agony by remembering that he had to bear the penalty that sin deserved for millions upon millions of people. In the garden, Jesus' humanity is fully revealed. Jesus' humanity is fully seen here in the garden. We see Jesus in his, dare I say, weakest moment. He remains sinless, yet he is now experiencing the fullness of what it truly means to be human. It is here that he will experience our grief. It is here that he will experience stronger temptation than any of us. So it is fitting to say that he was tempted in every way. And it is the view into the cup that causes Jesus to pray, if it is possible, take this cup from me. He appeals, silence. He appeals a second time, silence. He appeals a third time, silence. This silence lets us know that this was God's will. Now certainly, it would have been possible for God to have not poured out the cup of his wrath on Jesus, and he would not have contradicted his nature had he chosen not to send his son and left sinners to their just reward. But because God had proposed before the foundation of the world to save sinners, this then was not possible. As John Stott has said, God's purpose of love was to save sinners and to save them righteously. But this would be impossible without the sin-bearing death of the Savior. As committed to God as Jesus is, heaven is just as committed to him. The remark about angelic strength should reassure us that as we turn to him, he will strengthen us. Our texts are clear about how God provides the way out for us if, as we face temptation, we recognize our need for him. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13 Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous. Take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience. Nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, he has in the past and is now, and will always provide the way out as well, so that you will be able to endure it without yielding, and will overcome temptation with joy. Judas had arrived with a group of chief priests, elders, and temple captains to arrest the Lord. The traitor, had planned to identify Jesus by kissing him. Stuart adds, It was a crowning touch of horror, the last point of infamy beyond which human infamy could not go, when Judas betrayed his master in the garden. Not with a shout, a blow, or a stab, but with a kiss. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Jesus asked with infinite pathos. The disciples realized what would happen and were ready to take the offensive. In fact, one of them, Peter to be precise, grabbed a sword and cut off the servant's right ear of the high priest. 
Jesus rebuked him for using carnal means to fight spiritual warfare. His hour had come, and God's predetermined goals must come to pass. Graciously, Jesus touched the ear of the victim and healed him. Turning to the Jewish leaders and officers, Jesus asked why they had chased him down like a fugitive robber. Had he not taught in the temple area daily, and yet they had not attempted to arrest him? But he knew the answer. Even though Jesus is declared to have done nothing worthy of death during his trials before Pilate and Herod, he is sent to the cross. Jesus is mocked on the cross with taunts. His death, as unjust as it is, appears to be a defeat on the surface. But because of who he is, Jesus transforms it into victory, not just for himself, but for all who accept what he accomplished on a solitary piece of wood one Palestinian afternoon. Every leader feels alone at times, especially when venturing into new territory. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus experienced one of his most lonely moments. Every member of his team deserted him, just hours before he was to be tried, tortured, and crucified. His story in the garden is one of history's most potent examples of a leader's dedication. Every leader who does something significant for God has a Gethsemane experience. What can we learn from this lonely time? Gethsemane is a location where number one, spiritual battles occur. Number two, loneliness is felt. Number three, honesty is expressed. Number four, submission is required. Number five, strength is received. Why is this verse important for us to understand? We need to comprehend the solitude and the grief of Gethsemane because it helps us to understand the accomplishment of Gethsemane. Some have seen a relation between bloody sweat on the brow of Jesus with the curse of Adam, who would toil by the sweat of his brow. Adam failed the garden test. The forbidden fruit was a burden he could not bear. He stumbled, and humanity was born as wrathful children from that point forward. However, Christ, the greater Adam, triumphed in the garden where Adam failed. The blood of Christ combines with Adam's sweat. He took the curse upon himself. That is why we are to witness Christ's anguish in the garden. Because he could not let go of the cup, and he drank it all the way to the bottom. It means that there will be no more wrath directed at those who are united to Christ. He drank it instead of us. He drinks it all. There will be none left for us. Yet this was accomplished at Golgotha, but the obedience demonstrated in Gethsemane was also instrumental in removing the curse from us. His complete obedience at this time has been transferred to our account. This also lets us know that Jesus understands how it feels to be alone. He comprehends pain. He understands pain. We can express our distress to him. He comprehends. He has faced more temptation than any of us will ever face. He looked into the cup and drank it to the last drop, willingly and knowingly. We could entrust our pain to Him. God's great love on display. Have you ever had doubts about God's love for you? Take a look at the Garden of Gethsemane. You can see the Son of God sweating profusely, like drops of blood, or perhaps sweat mixed with blood. And you can see his determination to not only obey the Father, but to obey the Father in redeeming humanity. He drank from the cup in your honor. Look no further than the Father's silence. There was no other way to redeem humanity, because his wrath would be poured out on his Son. Allow the logic of Romans chapter 8 verse 32 to motivate you. He who did not spare his own son, 
but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If God had not been committed to your redemption, he would have let that cup pass from Jesus in the garden and transferred it to us instead. He would have let humanity be swallowed up by his wrath while preserving his son. He, however, did not. Not only because he loves us, but also because that is who God is. It is his nature to be self-giving, to give of himself so that others may live. You can have faith in this. Who can be against you if God is on your side?